My name is Lee Jae uh, Eun Jung uh, Shin, and I'm an indie filmmaker from Korea, but now I'm living in, in the U.S. And you were involved in filmmaking in Korea? Uh, I used to work for a TV station as a writer, mm. uh, we call TV scripter, and used to make our, our political programs and, or music programs, many kind of programs. Also, I, I work for as a uh, human rights film uh, festival director, and that gave me opportunity to look through a lot of uh, different documentaries mm -hmm. all around the world, which makes me uh, eyes open. So that's kind of gave me inspiration to make a um, documentary. And the city where you had the film festival that you were directing? Oh, you know? I'm from Gwangju. Mm -hmm. uh, in Gwangju, in 1980, there was an uprising called Gwangju Uprising. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, people who stood up against the dictator. Uh, many people were killed. But it was a turning point in Korean history because of people's uh, sacrifice. Uh, people later, after Gwangju Uprising, people were able to keep fighting and achieve democracy. So Gwangju is kind of a center of uh, democracy movement in Korea. I was young at the time, but it uh, gave me some kind of um, turning point in my life. So I can say that the, the reason I keep making documentaries is basically the Gwangju gave me energy and inspiration. Mm -hmm. So you decided that you wanted to make a film about Harvard. Yes. <laughs> First of all, how how was Harvard looked at in in Korea? Well, in Korea, Harvard it was Harvard is just an uh, amazing place. Every, every people admire of Harvard, and uh, it's a prestigious university, and it's kind of um, uh, some kind of brand. So, if we in, in Korea, some people go to Harvard. They usually publish their biography. <laughs> this is how I went to Harvard. <laughs> And believe it or not, it, the book says well. <laughs> so people really, um, Harvard is kind of a symbol of American dream, a center of American dream. And uh, it's a mystical place to co Korean people. We don't have a really um, deep understanding about Harvard. Harvard is just uh, the place I, m I want to go. So uh, the people <laughs> aspire. Yes, intellectuals yeah, it, and yes, other people aspire. Yes, of course, to, it, that's the prize to get it's to a, Harvard. It's a dream of every parent, <laughs> <laughs> I guess. To go to Harvard. Right? Yes, yes. So you, how did you discover something was there was something else about Harvard that people didn't know about? You know. That's well, a, first I went when I came to the U.S. Uh, my first first place I studied English was Harvard Summer School, and I was really really happy uh, because you know. I have opportunity to study this at this unbelievable university, and I really loved it. The atmosphere, everything was at the beginning was very good, and uh, there was something kind of you know questioning makes me questioning myself. For instance, there was a, uh, some program doesn't fit. Uh, for instance, there was a program um, focusing uh, um, racial differences. But the theme, the summer school at the time, the theme was uh, human rights. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I was wondering why Harvard put programs such like, you know, focusing uh, ethnic differences rather than ethnic similarity. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting question, right? And there was a lot of, it's kind of keep coming. Some kind of lectures were very boring, but also very uh, conservative. And because I have an um, image, or we have image about Harvard being radical or being left liberal. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I realized that it was just image. And I went to many events at Kennedy School or Korea Institute, and um, there was some kind of, some, pro some program was unbelievably um, conservative. But In what way were they conservative? Uh, it's, like, it's like very uh, slippery. When you see the title, it looks like some kind of, let's say, for instance, it's kind of Iraq, Iraq war, and it looks like talking about human rights in Iraq. But when you go there, you, you sit there, and at the end, the conclusion is we cannot, you know, stop war. <laughs> so it's kind of justify why U.S., you know, should keep fighting there, things like that. So uh, I thought kind of interesting because um, to me, the most interesting thing was, you know, Harvard, when people think of Harvard, people think, oh, left liberal. 
or liberalism or central, you know, academic freedom. And when you th we think about America, people think, oh, freedom and democracy. And so I thought the interesting connection between Harvard and U.S. how they create their image and kind of keep produce that image going. And I didn't know the details about Harvard history. So there was always questions remained in my mind. And then there was um, a lot of uh, political big figures visiting Harvard. And so in 2007, one of the conservative, conservative party uh, leader visited, who was about to nominate it to be um, presidential uh, candidate in Korea. Yeah, so and he has to come to Harvard, of course. No, no, you know. she, uh, it was she, a her. She, so it's kind of, I thought, oh, she came to the U.S. and she came to Harvard kind of to get the um, permission <laughs> from American ruling elite, mm -hmm. you know? Please get acceptance. Get, get accepted, approval, yes, to approve it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it was not a coincidence because, the, like before, before that, before her, another man who was also be um, kind of, you know, nominated, or people talk about he should mm -hmm. be the next president, he visited Harvard as well. So I thought, oh, Harvard is kind of you must to go, you, must, <laughs> you know? To, to get special to get, from yeah. the U.S. government. Exactly. And, and what role does the U.S. government play in, in, in Korea? What? I mean, is it, is it, uh, does it have a lot of influence in Korea? Of course. Um, as we know the Koreans' histories, uh, we were uh, colonized by the Japan, but the world war finished, Korea became achieved uh, independence, but it was not achieved by ourselves, it was kind of given. And U.S. basically changed that position. So since 1945, U.S. has a huge impact in Korean uh, polit politics, and it, it's tremendous impact. For instance, uh, in 1980, in Gwangju uprising, it was given by the, approved by uh, U.S. elite in 1980. It was meeting in 1980, May 22nd, the seven American ruling uh, security elite gathered at White House and decided to um, uh, wipe out Gwangju uh, by sending Korean military. So the approval of the massacre right. in Gwangju right, because was actually approved was at the top levels of the United States Exactly, government. because they saw the sometime Carter, Jimmy Carter, after the uh, um, Massacre said, sometimes um, security is more important than human rights. He says this to CNN. So, but in 1989, when Cor in, in Korea was achieved democracy and they tried to hearing congressional hearing, U.S. government denied any involvement or knowledge, and they said we have no knowledge or no or authority. Blah blah blah. They don't know anything yes. about what's been going on yeah, in Korea. Yeah, but it's always like that. So we, in Korea, U.S. is kind of, it's very imp huge impact to everyday life, not just in political way, because uh, if you come to the Korea, come to Korea, you probably see this is not a uh, foreign country. It's a kind of a 54, uh, one state in the U.S. It's, it's a kind replication. Of, Yes, it's, of, yes, of what's yeah. going on in the United States. It's a showcase. In Harvard, uh, there was a um, Harvard professor asked funding for Vietnam, uh, some kind of the educational program, and he mentioned that uh, we need a sh another showcase like Taiwan, Korea, and Japan. So we are their showcase. Pretty okay. open about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're frank about it. Frank about They're it. They're so yeah. frank about it, yes. <laughs> So then you, you decided that you really wanted to get into the, the real history of Harvard. What is this university? And were you shocked about the history of Harvard? I was very shocked because I did, had no idea. And my, it, was begin, it, was, it began by my um, wondering because I always wonder about history. I'm always fascinated by history. And I didn't know how Harvard began. And I didn't... I didn't have much information, but as soon as I started uh, digging, you know, all kind of history, I was very shocked, but also I was shocked it was unknown. You know, it's kind of how it's not um, unknown, but people don't really care, or maybe 
the information is buried under, you know, But that information internet. is not well known. Yes. The real history of Exactly, Harvard. yeah. But it has such a big influence all over um, the world, yet the real history of Harvard is not known by most people in the world or those people who look to Harvard as an ideal. Exactly. Of, uh, and a, how a, once, the, once the image was created, you know, how image was, is, is created and it becomes some kind of, you know, media shows it repeat, repeat over, over and over again and it became truth. And no one really questions what really happened. It's oh. a stereotype. Yes, so it was very interesting to read uh, books and you know, materials and to find out the real characters of Harvard. And the one question is, is why hasn't other people, there have been other like leftists or activists over many years at Harvard, why haven't they done something like what you did in this movie? Well, I don't know, but they done, they've done some books. Um, I think movie is kind of different. Uh, they made uh, 2001, there was Occupation, and they made the documentary of Occupation, which follow up kind of how they planned Occupation, how they fight, how they achieved. But I think there was no uh, documentary looking, you know, historical, historical analysis, analysis of, of, Harvard. History of Harvard. It's because probably Harvard is exclusive. It's very difficult to follow up what, what is going up going on there. To and penetrate. Yeah, to penetrate or to, to get approval. I see. So But you were kind of in Harvard uh, as a student in a way or a uh, you were Oh uh, I was a, a, I, I think I was as an outsider. So because my camera was small I often um, you know People think people thought I was just a tourist. Home, home hobby. Or something. Yes, yes. <laughs> Once the uh, the guard came and you can you can take a, a commercial film here, and so I asked him, "Do I look like a commercial?" And he said, "No," <laughs> and he just left. And I think because I'm uh, many times ask me, they ask me, "Who are you?" So are you student? And uh, no, and are you a director? Sort of. <laughs> I be, I'm becoming a director. <laughs> You know, on the job. And sometimes I I told them I'm nobody. <laughs> really, they asked me, "Who are you? Are you are you American? No, I'm Korean." And was, they were like kind of really puzzling their self, themselves. Why co a Korean woman <laughs> make a documentary about Harvard? So they it, were shocked. They, they were surprised. like, they were like, is we're, she we're crazy? To it yeah. Out, you know, what what is it? Here? Um, they ask me sometimes. Are you making documentaries about Harvard, like phrasing about Harvard? <laughs> so, and I said, no, not really. So I, I think there, there are a lot of confusion over me. So that's kind of also make it, make it easy to, to, actually, penetrate, to right. actually penetrate and get the real story. Yes, and also a lot of, uh, some people were really happy. Uh, they were kind of, you know, hidden stories they know and they, want, they have, wanted to have this opportunity, but no one really asked them. So right. this was the first time they were really being interviewed on tape on a, for a film uh, about the hidden stories of Harvard? I don't know, but I think maybe. I didn't know when I started, uh, but it looks like it's really first time. For instance, like uh, Professor Richard Levins, uh, after I interviewed him, I was so happy because it was an amazing interview. And I said, it was great interview. Thank you so much. And he said, I'm thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to help you. So... And I, I and he smiled, and the smile was very happy. Really, you know, kind of, I talked something I wanted to talk. He was asked the right questions. Yes, and yeah, also no one. I think there was out. no opportunity. I mean, it's my just guess, but some people, whenever I interviewed them, I feel like I gave them some kind of opportunity to talk, because no one, no one asked that kind of question, I right? See. So, uh, like a. Uh, some people were very happy. They came to screening, and they waited. And then they were. They, some people told me, uh, "Thank you, <laughs> making this documentary." Because it was really exposing history, which generally the public don't know about. They don't know about this real history. Well, what were some of the important aspects of Harvard's history that, um, that you take up in the film? I think an interesting thing about Harvard was the, how it began. Uh, was it, it, people know about it was a, first it was a religious place it was pl uh, pl uh, place to train um, theologians, theologians minister ministers, it so. is known but it's kind of very interesting to understand that because 
because people think today Harvard as it is or as it was, but it was a very different place when it began. It was basically a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant place gathering and um, producing their, their next generation, next leader. Uh, so it was kind of a rich white male cartel. So it's kind of this uh, keyword is very important to understand rich, white, and male. So if you understand these three keywords, you can understand everything. It's very easy to understand and it, you know, like how they were exclusive to um, uh, many different races or foreigners and well, even women were excluded. Yeah, from women the, were excluded for a very long time, even more than uh, people of color, I think. And but blacks were involved in building the, the university too. In, uh, well, there were slaves at the beginning, mm. and also there were. Uh, it's kind of how interesting how Harvard moves smoothly, meaning um, Harvard before Civil War, there was case a black boy tried to get into Harvard. And people protested. Harvard students and professors were protested, so he, they, he couldn't come. But after Civil War, which uh, we know what happened, Harvard quickly accepted two uh, black students, which was first black students in Harvard history. So they move. Get, Harvard kind of moved fast. So it's like women as well. So Harvard, there was no woman professor. And when in 1919, when women got a boat, right, right for boat, mm -hmm. Harvard firstly, uh, first time in their history, they hire a woman professor. So it's kind of, they always move fast and then try to um, kind of match what, you know, changing how to... Get ahead of the ball. Right, Get ahead uh, of right. The ball to show that they're right, progressive. Right. And in their ahead. sense, I think Harvard is pretty smart. It's kind of interesting. For instance, in the, during the um, uh, anti-war movement, people, uh, students understood, realized that how universities were involved, uh, CIA, secret research. That was exposed during right, the anti-war protest to, by the because students. of the protest. Yeah. And then Harvard new president, uh, Derek Bork, suddenly announced, quickly announced, uh, banned all CIA research. Looks acting like they were like more radical, right? But mm -hmm. they were kind of center of this secret research, but they don't say anything what we would we have done. But they say, oh, this is unbelievable, right? <laughs> so it's kind of how Harvard moved fast always, and they acting like oh we 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 don't do that do such things. So it's they're very smart in that way. I see. that's how they create their image. Um, compared to other universities. And mm -hmm. yeah, in that sense, I think Harvard is pretty smart and move fast. And Harvard, in your film, you show that it's played a very important role in uh, supporting imperial policies of the United States, ideological policies, mm -hmm. training people, and it's, it's played an important political role. Yes, yes. And, and propagating the mm -hmm. power and control of the United States. How does it do that? Well, I realized that Harvard was a, a training ground for American ruling elite. But at the beginning, I didn't have that kind of um, understanding. But we have to understand that Harvard was university um, uh, set up before even America was born, right? And and I actually the interesting thing is Harvard is um, placed in Boston which is kind of was birthplace of um, uh, American Revolution. And so a lot of people from the beginning of this em empire, uh, a lot of Harvard people were involved shaping this country. And this kind of um, role be continued, continued. And through the Civil War and then World War One and World War Two, a lot of Harvard people were involved in uh, making decisions, import very important decision makings. And particularly World War II, a lot of people, including the president, James Conant, who were actually directed um, making nuclear weapon, Manhattan Project. So a lot of people were involved in um, shaping Cold War uh, policy. So kind of Harvard is the birthplace of Cold War policy, you know, in a sense, um, you know, Russia Center. Um, so 
it's kind of always Harvard was forefront of uh, American um, foreign policy making. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting but how people always think that kind of um, separate the image, even though people uh, criticize American um, foreign policy, they still phrase about Harvard. And they talk, they come to Harvard and talk about, <laughs> talk about human rights, blah, 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 things like that. And I thought it was kind of ironic because people cannot see Harvard, you cannot see U.S. To understand Harvard's real character is kind of step to understand how U.S. Uh, America is kind of create imperial policy and um, uh, ruling this empire. And, and what is the ideology that Harvard d uses to propagate the U.S. empire? What kind of ideas do, do they use in you know uh, expanding the control and power? I mean, they say that we're bringing democracy. Right, right. You know, we're bringing democracy all over the world, is, and that's... Well, I think the, uh, um, through the history, these people would understand that uh, all the style of empire, like a British type of uh, imperialism, um, could, wouldn't work anymore. They kind of uh, needed a new type of uh, uh, management style, which they chose very indirect way through the, rather than sending troops or uh, sending to, you know, people, uh, bringing people di you know, directly, directly in control. But they, want they, they wanted to people. more more like uh, indirect way uh, using uh, democracy. They are saying kind of promoting democracy, right? So that's kind of once, in a sense, try to manipulate system. And if you manipulate the system from the beginning, like countries like Korea, for instance, it's very easy too because once you just send, you know, send some people and set up, it just follow, you know, as you want. And whenever they don't do the right job, you can just change the manager, right? You just change the president. And, and is that what has happened in Korea? Well, there. Are, um, I mean, they, the United States is managing. The Korean political system? I, I think so. I, I think it's been, uh, I think, for instance, uh, I don't, the first president of Korea was Lee Sung Man, who actually studied at Harvard as well. Uh, He's a Harvard man. He studied at Princeton and then he studied a uh, uh, master's degree in Harvard. I he see. was, uh, uh, but he was Harvard man in a way. And I think he was pro American deeply but I think I think US didn't like him because he kind of wanted to unify country you know and also there are a lot of uh, disagreement and 1960 there was a student uprising uh, against uh, election fraud and he was he resigned and he, uh, he, he he died in Hawaii right so and then we had a year later we had a coup, military coup led by Park Jong Hee. Okay, was that approved by the United States? That military coup? I have no doubt about it. I have no doubt because if you see just Korea, you might think, how do you know? But you have to see all around the world at the time what happening. Guatemala and other world country in the sixties, a lot of um, military dictator was Im imposed by U.S. government. It was, a, it was military, basically military uh, coup, uh, U.S. backed. U.S. approved. In other approved. words, the military in Korea right. could not have taken that action. Well, we have, a, exactly, because uh, we, uh, U.S. has the decision in, in, the, in Korean military. So it's, uh, I, I think about Park Jong-hee in my mind, I mean, I, mean, I cannot, uh, prove for that, but basically how he be became a power, also how he was um, removed he, by killing, assassinate by assassination was planned by American government. Well, that's pretty uh, direct action by the United States. And what was Harvard's position at that time? Were they in support of that, or the people that were running Harvard in alliance with the U.S. CIA and U.S. agencies? Did well, they... I, I cannot identify individuals, but they were uh, pretty much uh, involved in uh, U.S. Uh, top level of 
uh, foreign policy making. And at the end of the uh, Second World War, uh, the the new CIA organization mm -hmm. was set up, right. and, and and Harvard was quite uh, central to that development right. of the CIA. Right, because during the World War II, uh, there was OSS, uh, and OSS became uh, CIA, and a lot of Harvard professors were involved in turning CIA into uh, OSS into uh, CIA, Office of Strategic uh, Service, because they were mainly historians and they, they were mainly um, doing what they, were, what they did was to analyze all kind of information and then to you know, analyze all kind of data. So, uh, so this was kind of the brain trust. Right. Thinking about right. how to operate, right. how the United States could operate on a global level. Right. Using military so, and, yeah, and, and so from, security. Because the Manhattan Project, project was so successful and read U.S. Uh, you know, into top position in the world, I think the U.S. government uh, had a lesson. Oh, we have to use these scholars, right? So um, that's how I think all this kind of pol you know, political new structure began. So the professor now became, you know, in between, between government and, you know, big, between uh, inf central agency, uh, information agency, mm -hmm. kind of become more like a spy <laughs> and scholar in between. So this whole mess, I think, began by the World War II because of the huge success and wealth that U.S. achieved by using scholars during the World War II. And, I mean, most of the world, or a good part of the world, was destroyed. Yes. And the United States yeah. had all the gold at that well, time. Well, they had the more than fifty percent of wealth after World War Two, in the in the world. So you can you know you can do the mess. So U.S. was an, any country never had that kind of position. I think in the world, the global position. Now, also in your film, you yeah. talk about how neoliberalism, the policy of mm -hmm. privatization and deregulation was developed in Harvard. Many people from Harvard were involved in, in how they could uh, do these economic policies, structural adjustment programs around the world. Wanted, was, was that surprising to you about how they were involved in that as well? It was very sh shocking to me because I never thought, they, I know Harvard has a lot of endowment, but I didn't know how Harvard you know, controlled the endowment and I really, you know, people really didn't pay attention. And when I studied uh, Harvard uh, history, I, I saw the Harvard Management Company, which control, uh, controls Harvard Endowment, was founded in 1974. And I thought it was interesting here because 1974, uh, Friedrich Hayek got a Nobel Economic Prize, and Milton Friedman was two years later, 1976. It was t right. It was kind of timing this. U.S. was, you know, trying to turning, in, you know, changing into neoliberalism. Many people think that neoliberalism began like in in the 90s, but it's always system doesn't change in one time. It's kind of a process. There was always process to change. The regulation began more actively in the 90s, but there was a more like you know turning point in the 70s. And well, I think Carter, Carter right, was involved in, in the right, right. lines in the United States. In the and Reagan admi and administration. Reagan and I thought, oh, this isn't just the, just a coincidence. There Harvard was kind of preparing or you know politically uh, politically propagating. propagating something here. And that was very interesting because and I realized that the in the sixties, because of anti war movement the government and all this uh, big foundation was cutting funding to the university because they realized they don't want to give money to the university anymore because they don't do right job, right? <laughs> They're doing terrible job. <laughs> so uh, the Ford Foundation was doing some kind of big research, supporting research, uh, and they produced a Baco report called Baco report. And then this report suggested the universities and kind of lost opportunity to make a lot of um, profit right after World War II because they were kind of managing their net space in a safe way and they kind of uh, suggest to more do the risk 
investment. So that was kind of a turning point. So it's kind of a big corporation was, uh, you know, read the university to more risk investment. And but their their real idea was they don't want to give money anymore. But but they kind of saying, hey, do this way. You can do better. So that was kind of interesting uh, suggestion, I think. And and Yale and after Harvard, kind of they're doing risk investment. And it, this became kind of model to another university as usual because um, Harvard and Yale made a lot of profit, particularly after 90s, after deregulation and more, you know, wide open. And how did they make profit? Uh, because uh, what they did was uh, diversify. So, for instance, before uh, the har uh, before the university usually do the like very safe uh, investment by stock or you know, or, uh, but kind of they're doing more like a wide open like a global market, um, real estate market. They you know gas, oil. So they're speculating globally. Yes, yes. And now, how did deregulation and privatization, for example, in Russia or other countries or even in Korea, profit Harvard and profit individuals in Harvard? Well, Harvard is, was involved in uh, uh, investing everywhere. Uh, for instance, in Russia, uh, Harvard people were involved in Russia privatization uh, process, but also HMC secretly uh, and HMC become, was Harvard Management Company was uh, there was auction and was which not which which forbidden to foreigners by law, but they were able to uh, uh, participate and they become like a second holder of uh, Noble Petsk and Stanko Oil. So it's kind of a criminal so act. They, so they were <laughs> able to grab right, right, the resources right, right. of Russia. So because they had the information. Because yeah. they had information. And Jeffrey Sachs uh, was, I think, and others uh, were... I, I think I have to say it's Jeffrey Sachs wasn't that deeply involved because he was kind of, at the beginning, he was, um, his idea of shock therapy basically was implanted in Russia in the, in the early 90s. And Russian people became more poor because, uh, poorer because the, of hyperinflation. And somehow he was uh, kind of kept distance from her, uh, from the Russian project in, in the middle of nineties. Uh, uh, now, now the Russian project, like other projects around mm -hmm. North Korea, the net result was in Russia you have this oligarchy, right? You know, in, right. in Mexico an, an oligarchy with deregulation. Mm -hmm. After Korea, you have these mm -hmm. rich families that have been. Was that the result of these policies of? Of deregulation and privatization, the the basically transformation of other societies that had some e more equality to less equal societies. Yes, I think that's kind of what U.S. want. I think they don't want or they don't care or they don't want or more equal society. They, what they want is to divide society, because when you divide the society, it's very easy to control because they fight each other, and you become invisible and also. Um, kind of this oligarchy, Russian oligarchy, was kind of um, because of the, you, how Harvard people in, you know, involved and how they planned this privatization, and how it was backed by, supported by Harvard people. It was supported by supported by U.S. So government. So the, the engineers. Right. They 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 designed it. They designed it. So they are responsible. You know, but they always, it's kind of difficult to, you know, they're just consultant, <laughs> right? So it's kind of difficult to um, uh, get the who's responsible Because for most this. people say, oh, it's the oligarchs or these, but they don't right. know really who organized. Right, they don't know how did it happen. They just know, oh, this, uh, you know, how did it happen? They don't know the process, but it's, inter it, it, it's important that Harvard people, um, HIID was involved in uh, from the beginning uh, designing and uh, programming this Russian privatization um, program and it was backed by US government.
because they were blinded by Harvard. But I think they're not that stupid because CIA was actually checking. And I, I, I checked uh, many uh, articles and it was actually CIA reported there was huge uh, fraud and huge you know, problem. And the U.S. Um, Gore said, ah, don't, I don't want to hear this about, don't send me this report again. <laughs> That means the U.S. government knew, and they don't really care. So, in other words, the government, even though it was illegal, what was going on? Yes. And that Harvard people personally were profiting from the privatization right. of right. the society. They ignored that and allowed this criminal activity to go on. Right, because that's not their point. You know, what they want is to do privatization uh, process as they want. They don't really care how Russian people will suffer. What they want is to make to redesign, rebuild this country, uh, Russia can never uh, stood up against the U.S. Think about it. And so they destroyed the union. They basically destroyed the middle class. And they divide the society with super rich, virtuous, super poor. <laughs> um, and I think they wanted to, to keep their, uh, the, the government pro, as pro-U.S. Pro so that's why they kind of, you know, you know, doesn't care about what's going on really inside. Now, in Korea as well, the deregulation of the financial markets had a devastating impact with the collapse. And then people bought up Korean property at right, bargain right. sale yeah. prices. You know, I mean, it really... Yeah. I'm sure Harvard owns a lot of, uh, you know, profit in, in Korea. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Yeah, but it's it's because of the also we had IMF and so we have a lot of deregulation process. And what's the it relationship really, of Harvard to the IMF and the World Bank? Are they close? Closely, well, uh, well, I can say that a lot of people were from Harvard <laughs> <laughs> became head of IMF or so blah, blah blah blah. So it's a transmission but, belt. Yeah, into into these, Kennedy into School these. and Harvard Business School is a center to produce this uh, global elite nowadays. Uh, but uh, it's kind of, uh, the network is nowadays more, more, more that. It's kind of difficult compared to, you know, Cold War. In the, during the Cold War, it was very clear, peop, you know, to draw who, who is doing what. But these days, it's very difficult what are they doing because, or where they are from, because this person might be from Kennedy School, but it's also from Yale, you know, so it's kind of their... They were networking diffused, sort of diffused that. a little bit, diffused right. a little bit. Right, it's now, much more diversified. Now, John Kennedy was seen as a liberal, mm -hmm. you know, a, for democracy around right, the world. Right. And, and you kind of take that on in your, your film. Yeah, I thought these, the, the myth of John F. Kennedy is kind of a very interesting, to similar to myth of Harvard. And the image of Harvard being smart, um, young, and, 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 you know, kind of handsome, you know, uh, strong. It's very sim similar to Kennedy, isn't it? So I, th I thought that uh, Kennedy did something to create the image of, you know, positive image about Harvard. And if you look back, I mean, you know, what he really did, you can see, well, that was just a myth. And I think it's interesting to see Harvard that way. So I thought, you know, to understand Harvard, you have to understand Kennedy. But I had to. I have to say that uh, I heard. I, I was told that I was too critical about Kennedy, <laughs> and someone told me that Kennedy is the you know like last you know pride <laughs> what American people want to keep. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> too bad. That's but, tough. But you know, That's sometimes truth. truth has to be told in a tale. And um, well, this, I'm sorry. This idea of. Uh, <laughs> somebody saving America, mm -hmm. like Kennedy, mm -hmm. or now like Obama, Obama how he was yeah. presented. And Obama, of course, went to Yale. I mean, this is kind of... Oh, he went to Harvard, too. Oh, he went Harvard to Harvard, Law School, yes. Oh, Harvard Law School, of course. Yes. So this kind of ideological, you know, idea, stereotype, mm -hmm. that these people are the new mm -hmm. progressive right, leaders right. of the United States. Is this propagated by... Harvard? I mean, is this what they like to present themselves as? You know, the forward thinkers? There are and some the... roles, I think. There's some uh, relationship. I, I don't think it's just coincidence. Like, um, I tell you what happened when I was studying in, uh, at Harvard's um, Extension School. One day, it was in 2005, one day my teacher brought um, 
uh, guide, I mean, uh, some video. It was Obama. I, I never seen Obama speech before, and I was like, wow, what kind of man speaks so beautifully? <laughs> I thought it was like a new kind of, you know, Kennedy. And he, he told us at the end of the you know, class, he says, remember this man. He will be very important persons someday. And I, I, kind, I kind of got his message, and I thought, oh, he's saying he's going to be the next president. <coughs> Really, I felt that at the time from his facial you know, expression, you know, they were letting you know. He's kind of hint to us, and I told my husband, "Hey, I think I, you know, Obama's gonna be next president." And they, everyone laugh at the time, laugh, and I say, "No way!" Because at the time Hillary Clinton was preparing, you know, to be the pres um, election long, long time. But what happened? Look what happened. So. When Obama became president, everyone was saying, oh, new kind of hope, this is, uh, this is America, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no. <laughs> Same old thing. No, no, no. But the idea of having a black man. Right, right. You know, people could not conceive, how could a black man become president of the United States? But actually, some people were putting forward, who well, had a lot of power and money and wealth were putting forward a black man as president of the I think States. I think w what important at the time was the Wall Street needed a different man, you know, kind of different, um, sending different message to make people confused. Uh, you know, when Lehman Brothers, uh, well, it was, um, I don't know, it was September, October, when Lehman Brothers was uh, collapsed, collapsed that, that day was very important. When I read the newspaper, I was wondering why today? Why not? You know, why not last week or next week? Why today? Because that day, um, McCain was for the first time um, ahead of uh, Obama in the poll because of Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin suddenly, you know, brought this boom, and sure. McCain kind of was for first time. I think that week. He His was, poll was going, ahead. going away ahead, and I thought, "Well, this is a message when the Wall Street sent, you know, sent, saying we want Obama." In other words, the people that have the power. Yes, they want. That, that means the financial they, system. They, they they needed Obama, because whenever you uh, the the whole system is problem, you need a new new party. You can, you can clean up your mess with same party. You need. Different party whenever clean up the mess. Think about in Korea, 1997, right before the I, you know, country collapsed, you know, IMF crisis, uh, DJ was elected. Kim Dae Jung was, you know, he ran for the president, presidency election so many times, he never won. But for the first time, finally he won because the government is now collapsed, right? Mm -hmm. So they need always. They don't do the clean up, you know. They don't do the clean up with same party when they need somebody to clean up their mess. They, they have ha a new face. They have to have new face. But the thing change; it doesn't change. It stays the same. Well, you know, Professor Noam Chomsky said always one that the left liberal is more uh, imperialistic in the U.S. because it doesn't mean liberal means uh, what, what we think liberal. Left liberal means supposed to against uh, war and uh, you know to more concerned about justice and welfare uh, equality. But in the U.S., it doesn't matter your left liberal or, or right wing; they are all focused on the U.S. Uh, interest. You know, so how it, best to how best to propagate yes, in the United yes. States? Yes, yes. So how best think about Kennedy. You know, Kennedy was left liberal and how he was aggressively. You know expanded the war, Vietnam War, and all kind of, you know, tried to all the hands over Latin America and all around the world. Now, the, the world situation now, the United States has intervened with NATO, mm -hmm. European imperialist countries in Libya to overthrow Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. It's overthrowing the Syrian government with uh, Saudi Arabia, who's supplying military. They are expanding in Asia to move against China, mm -hmm. they are, uh, the Jeju, Base. Yeah, they right. Want a major Neighbor base. Expansion. Yes. Is this a change in in U.S. policy? And it seems like they're on the offensive again. 
well, I don't know. I'm not the per probably best person to ask. <laughs> but it is clear that the U.S. is um, try to rebuild their, you know, their um, their influence. It's you know over the years, the U.S. Uh, there were a lot of people struggle all around the world, and people now not you know no more blinded by you know propaganda. They know what U.S. has done, so there are a lot of anti-American you know sentiment all around the world. So I think U.S. also U.S. has to now control China. You have they have to you know. I think they're really scared about China, and I think that probably particularly the Jeju neighbor base issue. The and and wh what are they trying to do in Jeju? What's what's going on in, in Korea? It seems like this little base or this big base is an important part of the United States encircling China. How, mm. wh what is, is it's very important uh, uh, the uh, ge geological uh, geographically. geographically. It's very important to um, uh, to against uh, you know China because. Jeju Island is right between in Japan and China, so they try to kind of. I mean, U.S. never say we are gonna build. It's a Korean Navy say we're gonna build here. But as we know, as so f um, so far, we, U.S. has right to use any any naval base in Korea. So and then they try to. Um, enforce this uh, over the years and people were fighting um, courageously uh, but now probably you heard about it people were fighting and they kind of changed a lot this is a place a beautiful nature you know it just, it's a it, world historic it's a world yes site that, yes that, yes, uh, yes uh, by UNESCO it's a beautiful place but they're they destroyed and this um, construction is um, carried by Samsung uh, you know heavy industry, so they, it's kind of a big, you know, money involved also. The government kind of uh, pursuing this uh, construction, try to, you know, move on before this election. Mm -hmm. So they uh, destroyed the Grumby, um, the, the rocky uh, the coral area, coral the, reefs, the area, yes, yeah. yes. But people still don't give up, uh, still fighting. Mm, but uh, Jeju Island is kind of historically isolated from mainland, so people, you know, people still fighting. And but, but the Korean government is keeping Americans and other people from going there to right. visit and join in right. solidarity. Right, so right, right. Yeah, that's a that's a shameful, <laughs> what a what a mess. Democracy. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think I think uh, supporters of uh, Harvard. Probably a lot of supporters didn't see this film, <laughs> but even though some people uh, heard about it or saw it, uh, I think they don't want to really talk about it. But mainly people who saw in Korea, for instance, uh, a lot of people normally respond is like, you know, sh they were shocked. Or oh, they're like, oh my God, I couldn't believe it. Some people told me, like, uh, some person told, told me, he was like so um, depressed because <laughs> he couldn't believe anything now, you know. So it was. So he believed in Harvard and the yes, 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 of Harvard. yes. And one of the things about this uh, film is about the propagation of racist ideology by Harvard scientists or Harvard professors that was actually used by the Nazis. Right, right. That was uh, shocking. I was shocked, but a lot of people kind of uh, made a connection, I think. They, they said, oh, that makes sense, you know? So a so, lot of people had like no idea, but also people understood by, nat by, by nature because it wasn't just in the past, it's kind of continuing in, in science factor. So people also understand that, realize that science is not always right, right? Because we have always believed that science is just right because it's a fact but the important thing is who analyze it right so based on who you know the uh, who the scientist who is um they have who, an axe to grind exactly exactly based off on his um you know class and you know his ideology it can be used many different way 
So that's interesting that people began to understand it. From the whole history of Harvard. So right, you're opening right. the eyes. You know, even I was making documentary and I, I didn't, I was very shocked, very surprised. But when I tried to write a book now and I found even more details of how Harvard and Nazi connection, it was, it was really uh, unbelievable because one of my good friends who was activist told me after watching my documentary, he said, you know, I like your documentary and I agree everything, but Harvard fought against Nazi. <laughs> he said, he said, Harvard fought against Nazi. You know, John F. Kennedy, he was a student at Harvard and during the World War um, II, he sent, uh, he wrote at Harvard Crimson uh, without saying his name. He told to the president, uh, Frank, he sh Franklin Roosevelt should make made a deal with Hitler because they didn't want to fight. Harvard student didn't want to go to war, so they said, you know, they thought, you know, he should make a peace with Hitler. And a lot of people, like about more than 90% students at the time say, you know, we don't want to fight. And they, they kind of, some, a lot of Harvard professors, uh, particular eugenicists, supported Nazi and they were happy about it because, think about it, it was their dream come true. It was their, their, their uh, Nazi, you know, third um, reign was a kind of their, their dream because that's pure racist country. <laughs> So they wanted to support. Right? They so, believed in the idea of an area. Right, nation. right. So they thought this is unbelievable. They were fascinated and they would check what they were checking what was going on. You know, they tried to help, they tried to support. It continued until late seven uh, late nineteen thirties. So right before uh um US uh, World War really began. So kind of they had to keep um uh, U.S. and then these Nazi scholars continuously work together and Rockefeller Foundation uh, funded the Nazi uh, uh, research. And this idea of the rich white men. Yeah, rich white and male. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Rich white male. I mean, are these people still in charge? Uh, I think it, it changed a little bit, I, I have to say. Um, some people still probably say Still, because, uh, for instance, the Harvard uh, tenured professors, women professors, about 22% in 2010. So, yes, but, but student bodies diversified. For instance, uh, I think women, female students are about 50%. And uh, whole... Um, the ethnic groups are different nowadays. A lot of Asian students coming. Still, whites are the number one. But if you think about the uh, population, so you know the number of Asians grow so fast. Uh, so I think I, I cannot say still rich white male, but there's still that um, you know rich, rich, rich <laughs> yeah, still rich and <laughs> white. Uh, it's diversified. But if if they're going to control the world, mm -hmm. this one percent, mm -hmm. the people who really own the world, they would have to have people from around the world who right. propagate right. their ideas and who represent. They expanded, their interests. expanded ruling just America too, expanded ruling the world. So th that's how they diversified because now they're creating, recruiting, ruling elites of all around the world, like Latin America. A lot of presidents. Came, you know, pass through Harvard Kennedy School. So it's kind of now, it doesn't mean a good way, it means more like, more scary way, you know, in a sense, because now Harvard is not just uh, producing American ruling elite, elite. they are now producing whole, the, you know, around the world ruling elite. So the monopoly is actually became more severe, in a sense. Uh, and, and Obama's father was actually had come here to train to go back to Oh, yeah, I, 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 I read about it. You know, it's interesting when you go to Gwangju, in my hometown, <laughs> there's a big wall, a cultural center was building, and there was a big uh, construction site. And I don't know, I should say this, but, you know, people, gra there are a lot of graffiti, and there's one of graffiti says Obama's father is a CIA. 
you know, Obama's battle was CIA. So it's kind of a, you know, kind of joke. But I think it, in a sense, I understand why somebody, you know, wrote that. So because he was trained by the, you know, government money and, you know, he was brought to this country, right. and then he was trained to yeah. go back to go Kenya back to and then become and ruling, ruling elite, ruling, ruling right? Ruling Kenya, and this sounds like a big purpose of of Harvard University. That's how they to, they produce and rule, you know, rules the world. I think, you know, it, it, it's kind of uh, if you see just right side, it looks very good story, but if you see, you know, in a distance and behind side, it's also a different story. So when you see some something and some, you know event or some, you know, history, you have to always see both sides. You can't just, you know, blind yourself and just try to see bright side. Okay, well, thank you for the interview. Well, thank you so much. Okay.